The body of a popular 13-year-old girl is found with her throat slashed in a bathroom stall at school. Students are in and out of the bathroom all day, but none of them admit to seeing anything strange. Then, the school handyman is arrested, but did he do it? Years later, never-before-seen evidence points to another suspect, one with a bizarre story and even stranger motive. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris. If you want all the crime in half the time, you're in the right place. If getting more for less sounds good to you, it would mean a lot to us if you gave this a like and subscribe so you never miss a new recap. Now, on with the story with a big thank you to New York Times journalist Ruth Margulit, whose article, Who Killed Teherada, helped us put the pieces together. It began in Katsurin, Israel, around 4 p.m. on a clear winter's day in December 2006. Ilana Rada had just returned home from work to discover her 13-year-old daughter, Teyer, was missing. And she usually followed the same after-school routine every day. She'd come home around 2 p.m., leave her backpack in the kitchen, and help herself to a snack. But on that Wednesday, the house was empty. Maybe Teyer was at dance practice. She did have class that afternoon, but when the instructor said they hadn't seen her, Ilana knew something was wrong. Her first panicked call was to her husband. With their neighbor's help, they combed the neighborhood for any signs of their missing daughter. As night set in, they wondered if Teyer was still at school. Maybe she was hurt. Maybe she was stuck somewhere. Perhaps she got locked inside and couldn't find her way out. The search party fanned out through the school, calling her name. Slowly, they made their way to the girls' bathroom on the second floor. One of the four stalls was locked, so a family friend knelt down to check underneath. They saw blood stains and a pair of girls' sneakers. Teyer's body was inside. She'd been posed in a sitting position on the closed toilet lid. The stall was covered in blood. She'd been beaten about the head, her throat was slit in two places, and she had knife marks on her hands and arms. An autopsy revealed she'd been killed around 1.15 p.m. when her middle school was bursting at the seams with students and potential suspects. Rumors and gossip spread through the halls. There was talk of a falling out between Teyer and her friends. Did they eliminate her in the most brutal way possible? As the days went by, police focused on questioning everyone at the school that day. Among them was Roman Zadorov, a 28-year-old Ukrainian handyman. He had spent the last month laying tile in the school basement. The police asked to see the clothes he was wearing that day, but Roman said he'd thrown away his work pants. Apparently, they were too small. They discovered he kept a utility knife on him, but for some reason, he had gotten rid of the blade. With no alibi, he was arrested and brought in for questioning. At the station, Roman denied he had anything to do with the girl's death, and with no DNA evidence or motive linking him to the crime, police changed their tactics. They left Roman in a jail cell with a Russian-speaking cellmate named Artur to talk to. Paranoia set in around midnight on the third day. He believed the cell was bugged and loudly professed his innocence. Then he whispered to Artur, I made one mistake. I didn't clean the blood in the men's toilets. Artur asked, what about the knife? Roman replied, there was a little bit on the blade. He was right to be paranoid. His cell was bugged, just not how he imagined it. Artur was an undercover cop, and when he pressed Roman for more details, he talked about how the school kids made fun of him. Then they'd turn around and ask him for cigarettes. He'd refuse, and they'd make fun of him some more. He claims that Teyer asked him for a cigarette the day she died, but he refused. And like the other kids, she started insulting him. I caught up with her, he said. Then he made a slitting motion across his throat. I lost control, he said. Finally, Roman whispered, The truth is, if I knew who she was, I wouldn't have done it. At the time, Roman did off and on work for a man who was also friends with Teyer's father. Now that police had his impromptu confession, they doubled down and brought him back to the scene of the crime and told him to reenact it on a female officer. 
He did hesitate for a moment before entering the girl's bathroom, a fact that led some people to believe he didn't know where the crime was committed. Roman went to trial in 2007. The prosecution leaned on his jailhouse confession, even though he recanted it. They cited his detailed knowledge of the crime, including facts that only the killer would know. Things like how Tayer was posed in the stall after she was killed and what she was wearing that day. A three-judge panel sentenced him to life in prison for the murder in 2010. And theories about his wrongful conviction gained traction overnight, and his biggest supporter was the last person you would expect. Ilana Rada, Tayer's mother. She never bought the police's story for a second. Instead, she's convinced that one or a group of Tayer's classmates killed her in some satanic ritual. Ilana said people envied her daughter. Through her own investigation, students told her about a cult with a female ringleader who terrorized the school. Then there is the lack of physical and forensic evidence tying Roman to the crime. None of his DNA was found in the stall. The murder weapon was thought to be a knife with a serrated blade, but his utility knife was a standard pointed tip blade. Then there were the bloody shoe prints on the toilet seat that didn't fit Roman's size. There were also witnesses who claimed they saw him just minutes after the murder. They say he looked completely normal, not a blood stain in sight. But in Israel, a confession is enough to get a conviction. The case was playing out like a Netflix documentary, probably because it was a Netflix documentary. In 2017, Netflix bought the distribution rights to a four-part series called Shadow of Truth, produced by Israeli filmmakers Yotam Gwendelman and Ari Pines. They alleged the killer was not Roman, but a woman, Ola Kravchenko. During production, Ari and Yotam got their hands on a never-before-heard statement, one which would change several people's lives forever. 28-year-old Adir Habani arrived at the police station in 2012 to file a complaint about his ex-girlfriend, Ola Kravchenko. He claimed she suffered from violent tendencies. According to him, she had recurring fantasies about a wolf living inside her head, a wolf that craved blood. And she confessed to killing Tayer. On the day of the murder, Ola allegedly called Adir at home to tell him things were going to get messy. She allegedly confessed to stealing his clothes to disguise herself as a man. She then snuck into the girl's bathroom at the middle school and waited to kill whoever was unlucky enough to walk in. Why target the school? Because she had been a student there years earlier. The police were rightfully suspicious of Adir's story. Why would he wait years to say something? He claimed he was scared of her, and still scared of her, and what she might do. Even though they already had Roman locked up on a life sentence, the police followed up on Adir's lead and questioned Ola. She told them she and Adir had just ended an abusive nine-year relationship, and any stories he was telling about her were just his way of getting revenge. Police combed through her phone for evidence to corroborate either his story or hers. And what they found were over 700 threatening messages from a deer after their breakup. One read, I'm going to trash your name in life so hard you'll be ashamed to show your face. The messages went on and on like that. A deer was arrested for rape a week after arriving at the police station. When they searched his computer, they found a document titled confession that reads like a script for the story he told the police. He admitted to beating and raping Ola once, claiming he misinterpreted their sexual games. He called the violence part of their sadomasochistic relationship. And while Adir was a bona fide abuser, Ola's behavior over the next week didn't help her case. After four days of questioning, Ola wandered barefoot into a college dorm near her mother's home. She was talking to herself and used a broken bottle to attack a guy who had recently rejected her. Officers arrived and she fought back. She tried to bite one of the cops in the neck saying, I'm hungry for the good stuff. When they got her to the station, she told the police, I woke up feeling I was in a warm place with blood and innards all around me. She admitted to carrying a knife that morning, of which the officer asked, Do you have a special interest in this knife? 
Ola responded, no, in people, in what's inside of them. She claimed to be starving and said her violent urges were getting harder and harder to control. When asked whether she'd ever acted on those urges, she wouldn't answer. Ola spent the next two years in a psychiatric hospital. Meanwhile, police concluded that Adir's claims didn't amount to anything. There was no direct or indirect evidence linking Ola to Tayer's murder. And then, one shocking piece of evidence surfaced. Two mysterious hairs found on Tayer's body were retested, and guess what? They were a match to Adir's mitochondrial DNA. Cell phone data showed he was at work all day, about 12 miles from the school when the teenager was killed. So if he was telling the truth and Ola was wearing his clothes when she committed the murder, it would explain why his hair was found on the victim's body. But as shocking as it is, the evidence is weak. MTDNA is tough to prove guilt. It's a highly debated subject at the intersection of DNA science and criminal law. And those hairs could theoretically also match tens of thousands of people. Some experts say MTDNA can only be used to prove someone did not commit a crime, and none of the hair matched Roman Zadorov. As Roman's retrial was winding down, his lawyer made Ola the foundation of his defense, and it worked. After 11 years of appeals, a judge released Roman Zadorov from prison and put him on house arrest. He was granted another trial in 2021, and many believe the mtDNA evidence will prove his innocence. But that still doesn't reveal who killed Tayer Rada. Ola has not been charged with the murder. In fact, the prosecution cleared her of any crime and used her only as a testifying witness during Roman's retrial. So, what do you think? Any theories about who did it? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.